Hello, knitters and friends. Welcome to episode eighteen of the Seedling Stitch Knitting Podcast. I'm your host Athena. I am a knitter and an Asbury Knitwear designer coming to you from Vancouver, Canada. And in the past week, I just passed my PhD defense. I study mechanical engineering, and I wore my hand knitted farewell vest to my defense, which has helped me a lot by like boosting my confidence.、Uh, so I am now Doctor Liu. Provided that I finish a few modifications of my final thesis,、uh, so that's about me.、Uh, and this channel, this podcast, is where I share my knitting, crafting adventures, crocheting,、uh, darning, sewing, everything fiber related, but mostly knitting.、Uh, and I always like to share a few tips and tricks that I learned along the way. Uh, if you are new, welcome. And if you are a returning viewer, thank you for following along my knitting crafting journey.、Uh, and in this episode, I have a lot of exciting crafting、uh, projects to share. So without further ado, please grab your knitting and let's get started with today's episode. And just as a side note, you may hear some clicking and keyboard typing noises. That's my husband just working by my side. We live in Vancouver, which is one of the most expensive cities to live in the world. We just have a one room where he works from home as a programmer, and here I'm doing podcasting. So、um, forgive me if there's some noises, but just just ignore him. And let's talk about knitting. And first, just an announcement: I have released my pine and fur hat pattern on Ravelry, as well as my coffee shop. This is an、uh, worsted weight with all these cable patterns hat, and I call that pine and fur because this is like a pine tree and cable, and this is a fur tree cable. Uh, and it features these smaller cables that runs from the brim to the top, and and also I am running a pattern sale because I first I just passed my PhD exam and,、uh, and one day after that November sixteenth it was my thirtieth birthday so two big achievements accomplishments to have within one week. So I decided to run a pattern sale. I am fairly new in designing, and I've only designed like a few socks, accessories, and one hat pattern.、Uh, but anyway, you can use the code, the coupon code,、uh, Happy Birthday, to get thirty、uh, percent off on any of my patterns. I'll put the link in below. It's、uh, available. The sale is available both on my Ravelry as well on my coffee shop with the coupon code Happy Birthday. And this birthday sale runs until November twenty seventh. So,、uh, if you watch this episode a few days later after the release, I think you should still be within the time of the sale. So,、um, just take a look and see if there's any pattern that you'd be interested in getting. And that would be like a birthday gift for me, and I really appreciate anyone who's interested in my pattern, or even if you just click the heart and favorite the pattern, I am very grateful for that as well.、Uh, and I'm very grateful for you listening to me chatting about these random things about knitting.、Uh, and let's talk about knitting. So. Let's start with what I'm wearing. I'm wearing my first、uh, self-designed sweater called the Harbin sweater. I just finished knitting it last week. No, I think two weeks ago. Last week. And let me just do a little modeling for you before talking about it. Here's the sweater and some details.
Uh, so I've been designing and knitting this sweater for like a month or so uh, and uh, I chatted about like the design inspiration like these motifs in my previous episodes and uh, this I call this the Harbin sweater because uh, I, this these motifs on the colorwork yoke were inspired by my hometown Harbin in northeastern China. I put a few pictures in my previous episodes, but just in short, if you are new here, uh, and this top motif is the Songhua River bridge in my hometown, and this is just like a pine tree leaf with some snowy snowflakes and then this is the Saint Sophia Cathedral in my hometown and this is a uh, ice bar and I don't think you've seen the bottom color works in the previous episodes I think these are new and these color work design are like snowflakes melting into a white ground so I think it it's it is sort of logical that here there are some ice bars and some snowflakes and these snowflakes are dripping dripping and until they fall onto the bottom and falls onto a white snowy snow covered ground and that's a very common scene in my hometown it's a very cold place near russia so yeah so you can imagine uh, this sweater was knitted with the East Tex Lat Lopi yarn, the Icelandic uh, kind of rest, a very rustic, uh, very warm woolen yarn. And I think these are perfect for color works. And you can see how these fibers, they are like sticking out and they melt in. Uh, I've... And... And the and for this yarn, the blocking and the wash the washing and blocking really made the dif uh, really made the difference. I've also steam blocked it a little bit just so that the color work just melt in with each other better. I used four colors for this design. This like grayish white. I really like this. It's called ash heathered brown, and I think it's. It, it really um, describes, you know, it really like mimics the snow in my hometown. It has those like gray heather in it. It's not like a pure white. And, and in my hometown, the, the snow is not always like those fairy tale, like clean and white. It's, it's always like grayish with some like, <laughs> grayish dirt in it and and I I, I think it and and uh, I think it describes very well the feature the snowy feature of my hometown uh, I used four colors this white the blue the green and the rust brownish color and uh, the color work design is not difficult in itself it just I, I, there's only two colors in each line, so uh, that was rather easy to knit. Uh, and speaking of color work, there is a color work tip that I recently learned from um, 25 Charming Socks by Stone Knits. I believe it's a new release for color work socks. I didn't buy the book, I was just like looking at the Amazon page and there there is like a preview and there were there were like five to ten pages of the book that you can read before you decide whether you want to buy and I was just uh, and I was just scanning through that randomly and there was a chapter talking about color work that really helped me uh, it it tells you that like when you are doing two colored color work, for example, when I'm knitting these uh, snowflakes, and there is a background color like the blue, and there is a, a contrast color like the white. And when I'm knitting this motif, I would want the white color to pop out and the blue color to be at the back. And if you want to create this effect, what you can do is that um, you, when you are doing stranded color work, 
Um, and there is one strand that when you carry the floats is above and the other strand is below. And you need to keep the like the, the popping, the color that you want to pop up, like the white one, for example, here, you need to carry the floats below at, uh, at the back of your work. And the background color, for example, the blue here, you need to carry the float above. And uh, just for me, I use two hands to knit color work, stranded color work. Uh, for the, the right hand, I use the uh, English style and the left hand, I use the continental style. And uh, just to make the white pop up, I would use the right hand to uh, knit the white color and the left hand to knit the blue color and so that I always keep the blue colored background colored yarn, uh, the float carried above and the white color in my right hand, I keep that below. And this way the, the white color will be slightly one layer on top of the blue. And I can apply this through all my color works. For example, here, uh, this green bit, I will, uh, that will be the pop-up color and the white bit will be the background color and it changes. For example, if I go to here, the background color would be uh, blue again and the white would be the pop-up color, which will be carried on the right hand. So uh, that's something to keep in mind if you are doing stranded color work. So I talk about the, uh, so I talk about the inspiration and the yarn and the knitting and I suppose you might be interested in learning like how I design this from a technical mathematical side and I can chat about that a little bit. Uh, for this, the construction is a top down round yoke design, which is mostly like the most basic, easiest design. And as I am very new to sweater designing, I chose this construction as the simplest to start with. And for reference, I looked at a few color work round yoke sweaters. I looked at the uh, Lop Lopi anniversary sweater specifically. It is, uh, it is a free pattern. It, it, it is a free pattern on Ravelry. And that's the, the, the company of this low PR. They have some pattern and they were celebrating their like 100 or 150 year anniversary or something. And they made a, a sweat and they made a pattern for free. And for their version, it was a bottom up sweater also featuring a round yoke. Uh, but I could look at their stitch numbers, learn how they construct their sweater, uh, and I reverse everything for a top-down construction. But of course, I did not f copy all their stitch numbers. I what I look what I was trying to learn from that uh, from that pattern specifically is how they uh, design this yoke basically they need to make a wedge shape of the chart and they need to uh if it's bottom up they need to decrease at certain places and so for me i would try to mimic the same proportion and then um increase at for example if the inc uh, for, uh, like increase for example at the fourth row 10th row or something in, in like in similar locations. So that's one thing that was helpful. And another helpful was from this uh, Chinese translated Japanese book. If you are new, I lived in China until until I'm 23 or 25 years old. Uh, if, and so for my knitting, although I started knitting last year here when I was already in Canada, but I was also able to uh, draw a lot of like resources from China uh, or other East Asian like Japanese resources. Uh, I I learned the Japanese I, I I learned the Japanese language for a couple of years, so I'm 
able to read some Japanese patterns, but mostly I collect Chinese translation of Japanese pattern books. There are a lot of awesome Japanese uh, knitting books that got translated into Chinese that I was able to use and this is one of their top-down sweater construction uh, top-down sweater Design books featuring a lot of top-down sweater and what helped me a lot was uh, In the Japanese patterns, they always draw schematics uh, instead of like in English style patterns they write the row by row and I, I found those schematics were really helpful for me to understand the construction uh, in their like schematics. They, they always draw the measurements, the stitch counts, and how these different pieces connected together. And as a, an engineer, I really appreciate that. That's the language I speak. Um, so I learned that as well. And while I cannot show you any schematics from the book itself, I can show you some <laughs> some sketch, some sketches that I did while I was doing the designing. Uh, it will be a little bit like mad scientist. <laughs> so, for example, this this is my knitting journal, and I draw uh, I draw some like measurements. Uh, and I, I can draw like for the yoke how uh, how deep I want it to be and uh, how many stitches I'm going to separate for the sleeves and the main body, um, things like that. However, this is only for one size and I'm going to figure out how to scale that, how to grade that <laughs> to different sizes i'm i'm thinking from like xs up to 5xl if i if i can manage to do that i've done some research um like I, I've, I've looked at a lot of revelry patterns and see how they how many sizes they grade their garments to, like they do from probably 80 centimeter bust up to 45 XL, it's like a 140 centimeter bust. And I think this size that I knitted for myself is probably size M. It is, uh, as for measurements, this bust is 20, uh, oh, sorry, is 97 centimeter uh, of the sweater circumference. And I myself is probably like a size S body. My bust measurements is 82 centimeters. So I gave myself a lot of positive ease for this sweater because I want it to be big. And this yarn is <laughs> not the softest. It's the, probably the most rustic and it, it can be a bit scratchy and rustic. Uh, I, I, I probably should like wear a long sleeve like shirt it, below it. It's, it's not recommended to wear this directly to the skin. However, I'm practicing. I'm practicing the tolerance for wearing the sweater because I love it and it looks so nice. So anyway, I'm thinking this sweater, I can like wear another sweater inside and like wear this Harbin sweater, Lopi sweater as an outer garment in winter. So I just knit it huge so that I can do that. And I also think this motif is perfect for like doing a snow fight and it's just going to be fun anyway. So, so I sort of knitted the size M for myself and I still have to figure out the grading and for this pattern I'm also thinking I should do some tech editing. I've, I've never done tech editing before because so far I've only designed small accessories and usually test knitting was enough but I think for a sweater it's better to have some experts to look at it. Uh, so if you know any like tech editor 
especially within Canada, uh, please recommend to me. I'm still trying to figure out the grading. And once I do, I'll finish the writing of the pattern and hopefully go to tech editing and then hopefully go to some test knitting. So stay tuned if you're interested in test knitting this pattern. But anyway, this will be my first time of writing a whole garment pattern as well as doing the grading. I don't know what's the standard way of grading. I'm just like, I, I can aim for measurements and I know like the gauge. So I can just do the math, all the scaling, just calculate things into different proportions. I think it would work, but if not, I, I will find, I will seek some help for grading. We'll see how capable I am. I think I'm, I think I'm good with mathematics, so I should probably be able to do the grading by myself. Oh, there were, there were also another interesting construction about this garment uh, that I learned from this book. I talked about last time that uh, I, I was, uh, I, I wanted to raise the back so that the back pieces is a bit taller than the front pieces. And to do that, instead of doing any short rows, I just knitted an extra length below the yoke of, uh, in the back. And uh, it's just like knitting front and back. You can probably see here, uh, it's about this much. And after that, when I'm like picking and when I'm like gathering stitches for the sleeves, I just pick up the stitches around these. Uh, I'll go closer and you can see here. This is the raised back, probably like about four centimeters. And then I pick up stitches here when I'm knitting the sleeves in the round, you can see the direction of this knitting here. So th this part is the sleeve, this part is the wrist back, and this part is from the round yoke. And this part is the underarm where I casted on using the backward loop cast on for a few stitches, uh, which I believe is a pretty standard construction for other sweaters as well but like the wrist back with just knitting uh, in the flat for a few rows that's um, I, I, I think it's, it's not very common I don't think it's very common in English patterns uh, I've, I've never seen any English pattern that does that but in but also I haven't knitted that many sweaters uh, in, in English, but this construction is quite common, I believe, in uh, Japanese style. So this book, all the patterns use this method to raise the back, and it's quite easy to do. No short, no short rows, and just knitting in the flat. So that would be an interesting thing. Um, there were also an interesting thing that came up in the knitting and designing of this sweater. So the first time when I finished knitting the, the sweater, it was very short. Uh, I probably like only knitted about 20 centimeter. No, I only knitted like 17 or 15 centimeters of the blue. And then I went directly to the color work because I was kind of bored and I think cropped length is good, but it turned out to be too cropped. And I had to add some, I had to add some distance. I had to add some blue here in the middle. And I didn't want to rip back. Um, as a knitwear designer, I should probably be comfortable with <laughs> ripping back. But uh, if I don't have to, then I don't. And I figured out a method that allows me to do that. So I, I basically, um, I, I'll put some, I'll put some photos by the side as 
when I describe what I did. I, for example, I want to add a few rows in the middle here. And what I did was that I, I used some thinner, smaller needles and the lifeline method to uh, pick up some stitches around one row. Uh, so you sort of just like pick up the right leg of the V of a knit stitch and then you go around and then you do the same thing one row, two rows below. So uh, you, you pick up another row of lifeline. If you want to see a video of this, you can like search for how to do a lifeline in knitting and there's a method where you can pick up some stitches around. If you like unwrap your stitches, these stitches, these stitches on your needle will be secured. So I had two lifelines and then I unpick the row between these two lines and then I can basically cut my sweater in half um, at the waist and it, it, it looks quite interesting. I, this is what I call as a sweater surgery. <laughs> and I cut the sweater in half and then I knit a few centimeters from one of the needles and then uh, after I've added enough length I use Kitchener stitch to graft back the two pieces of my sweater and then my sweater is healed like this now <laughs> and it's it's totally invisible it's totally invisible you, you I probably did it here but you you won't be able it's you won't be able to see it because the Kitchener stitch looks exactly like a knit stitch so you so the grafting is invisible and and you don't have to rip back you don't have to like waste any yarn which was quite good and I also <laughs> did the same thing for the sleeves as well because my sleeve was not long enough the first time I finished knitting it. And uh, I also tried to just unravel the yarn to rip back, but this yarn is so sticky, it's so rustic. It's, I tried to like rip back and ravel and I can, I almost cannot do that. And so instead I went with the sweater surgery method. So I think that could be an interesting tip for you. Like whenever you need to add a few rows or, or this can also be useful if you want to reduce a few rows in the middle of your sweater. You can do the same. You can like use the left line to pick up some line above and below and then uh, cut or rip back some rows that you don't want and then you use Kitchener stitch to graph them. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there's a tutorial on this, but it, these are just separate skills, lifeline and uh, grafting with Kitchener stitch. And uh, I, I just thought this would work. Well, theoretically, I don't see why it won't work. I, I, <laughs> I don't know, it's like a invention. I, I'm sure someone must have invented this before. It's, <laughs> but it's just an, <laughs> an interesting story to tell during the designing. So uh, what else about the sweater? There was one thing that I was a bit disappointed is the color, uh, the, this blue color I bought at the yarn shop. I, at a few different times and uh, at some and at some later time they didn't match the lot number so you can see from here to here the blue is not the sh same shade the like the blue that I use for the yoke is more of a saturated blue blue and the bottom is like a grayish fade blue 
Uh, it was okay for the sleeve because uh, for the sleeve it's an, the the next lot and the top is the previous die lot, but it's a little bit visible on the body. But I think I'll just have to deal with it, <laughs> and uh, you probably won't notice <laughs> if if I don't tell you. But you know, as a knitter, when you have these like minor things caused by dialogue it's a bit sad but um but it's okay next time i'll pay more attention to match everything including the dialogue so that's everything about my harbin sweater i'm so proud of it and i'm so excited about writing the pattern uh and be like a real <laughs> knitwear designer where we where i have a sweater design so let me move on to my next finished object the next finished objects are some more christmas balls hey. uh, these are the design from oh these are the design from the arnie and Carlos uh, 2019 mini crease ball design. Uh, you can get the pattern from their website. Uh, and just now that I look at this, the, the Christmas balls and my sweater, they kind of match up like in the same style. I think my sweater is kind of Christmassy and it's very snowy. But let's go back to the Christmas balls. Uh, these are, I don't remember which, there are like 24 Christmas ball designs in their pattern. Arnie and Carlos, they design 24 new Christmas balls every year and they had this advent calendar thing. Uh, I, I needed one Christmas ball in my last episode and then these are some new ones for some other professors or like colleagues, lab mates that I want to gift to as my parting gift after graduation of my PhD. So I had three supervisors. I've knitted one ball for my main supervisor and I knitted the other two for the other two supervisors. Uh, and then this is for a lab manager that I had and he's the best. Like he's, I feel like he's the only one that cares about the safety all in these experiments so he deserves this <laughs> uh, the yarn i used are some yarn from my or, or the yarn that my grandma gifted me and this green one is the chinese yarn company hui gui xian i've talked about them a lot this colorway is called the christmas green and i think it's a great colorway for knitting christmas balls and it this one is a merino yarn and it's it's quite it gets quite fluffy after washing and there's almost no stitch definition on here there are some like technical points of these Christmas balls. The increase, so it's a uh, like knitting in the round from bottom up. The pattern lets you use the four uh, double pointed needles, but I use uh, long circular needles and the magic loop method. I had no problem with that. The increase was a uh, I, I don't know what's the term called. You should check uh, Arnie and Carlos. They have a tutorial video for this. But uh, if I just describe that with word, it's a lifted increase. So you, you, you knit the added stitch into the right leg of the knit stitch below your left needle. And you also mount that stitch twisted 
And I think that's how they create this tight fabric while doing the increases just without any hole on your uh, on your on your Christmas ball. And the decrease on the top are done with uh, knit two together in the back loop. And also you mount your stitches twisted so that avoids some hole as I imagine. And that's some new things that I learned. And uh, so these are all the gift knits that I'll have probably for this year. And I still have many of these Christmassy color yarn left and I'm going to knit some Christmas balls for myself and just hang them anywhere in my home. So moving on to my next whip, I have a crocheted finished object that is my uh, buttercup bag or something. It is like a knockoff of Sandy Scar summer issue magazine. There, they have a buttercup bag pattern, which I wasn't able to get, but I was just like mimicking of photos of their design. And I was uh, crocheting this with my grandma's yarn. And I think last time I, I, I was like, I think last time I finished almost everything except for the handle. And last time I might have said that I'm going to like make a long handle, but it turned out that I didn't have enough of my grandma's yarn. So, uh, so instead I just like did this type of handle that's very similar to the original design of buttercup bag. Uh, what I did was, uh, so just about the construction of the bag, it's like you crochet some sunflower granny squares you uh, connect them together and you crochet a long belt and you connect the, the, this bottom edge belt with the, with the panels of the granny square. And then you crochet in the round for, I think I crocheted two rounds. And then on the third round, when I went here, I did a few chain stitches. I think I did 17 chain stitches and then keep crocheting in the round and then did another 70 cro chain crochet chain stitches. And then I keep crocheting in the round. And when I went to these uh, crochet chain stitches, I, well, I push my crochet hook under the like the, the pearl bump as well as one of the like the back of the V leg of the crochet chain. So I put my crochet hook below two strands of yarn and then pick pick up the new loop and do the single crochet stitches. Uh, th these are all single crochet stitches along the belt and along the side. Uh, on the side it was crochet in the flat and on the top and the handle it was crocheting in the round. And then I just like keep crocheting in the round for probably like four to five rows until I practically don't have enough yarn. And then I have this little bag and I, I love it and I can wear it like this or like this and I can hold some slightly larger knitting projects in it as well as a water bottle which is quite important to me it's and it's it's quite it's quite handy and what I found is that crocheted fabric is so sturdy I haven't lined it uh, but but like when I put some heavy things in it, it doesn't stretch too much. Uh, and as for the hook size, it was 4.5 millimeter crochet hook. And the yarn, I held three strands of fingering weight 
woolen yarn of my grandma's yarn together to make this. So it was like it has a vintage-ish look because of the color and um, it will be a nice handy little bag that I have. And speaking of bag, I have another bag. Hey! This is my first sewing project. I learned to sew. I, uh, yesterday, last night, last night, I went to a sewing workshop. Uh, it was the La Movida studio, La Movida sewing studio in Kislano, Vancouver and they offer an intro to sew adult intro to sew workshop or class uh, it, it was a three hour workshop where it teaches you how to sew for completely beginners Just, uh, enrolled in that class sort of as my uh, finishing phd and a birthday present <laughs> because i wanted to learn to sew the motivation for me to learn to sew is to be able to line these bags but i um but i i didn't have enough time to line the bag uh after after doing the whole workshop it was it was really fun it was a great pro uh it was a great class like intro class for complete beginners and if you are around vancouver and wanted to learn how to sew i would really uh, recommend their courses. So during that three hour of workshop, they first teach you how to use a sewing machine. They, they teach kids as well. So their sewing machine is like quite good and safe quality where you can control the speed. And it was really helpful. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, they first like teach you how to thread the machine and then they give you some pieces of paper where they have those like straight lines and curved lines and squares. And then they ask you to practice to sew along these lines. And they like taught you how to use different parts and buttons of the machine. And after that, they taught you to sew this whole bag. And this is a reversible bag. with a pocket with the working pocket and with handle and a strap so it's a quite quite sturdy nice bag and they offer the fabric and everything you don't have to bring anything and this fabric is also waterproof from like F fjord raven the like the brand that sells those uh, waterproof backpacks and like they have these collaboration with that shop and they have some extra fabric that they don't use and they just gave it to the sewing studio for <laughs> making these bags uh, and for for the sewing if you know sewing at all <laughs> you you can probably guess the construction of the bag or if you don't know sewing I don't know if you're interested in learning about it. Uh, anyway, so like you, 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 you sew along. Uh, the the teacher taught me. Uh, the the teacher taught us like where to go, how to cut fabric, and how to sew along these lines and pin these uh, pieces to each other, and then like so just sew these lines one by one. Uh, it's like just mostly straight lines and uh, and some like you, you can like turn corners here but it's mostly straight lines and you you like sew everything in the wrong side and then you leave a little hole here and then you flip the back from the wrong side to the right side and then form this. It was the magical moment when you pull everything from the hole. It's like magicians pulling rabbits and a lot of good 
things from their hat. And then like after you pull everything, uh, after you pull the right side of the bag from the wrong side of the bag, you, you have the result and then you see the last line just like around here to form this bag. So I, it was fun. It was like more of a focused job than knitting. So like you cannot watch TV while doing sewing. But the instructor there said like it was uh, relaxing for her uh, and then like she can listen to podcasts and relax but while well, like looking at things and sewing. And I think it was enjoyable and a nice skill to learn. And I'm looking at sewing machines. I found a um, Japanese brand of sewing machine that was selling that that was available for purchase in China as well. And it's quite affordable, like something a bit over something below 300 Canadian dollars if I convert the Chinese price. So I think I'm I'm going to purchase a sewing machine. I think it will be handy. And also I found a few, you know, Japanese sewing books. A trans Chinese translation of Japanese sewing books, as you know. I think that I like the Japanese style or like designs. Knitting as well as sewing, I feel the fit um, it, it's better for me. Perhaps because I'm like East Asian as well, uh, and like just with this body type and shape, their style works a lot better for me. And there were some like long pleated skirts that I want to learn how to make, how to sew. So there, there were some like pattern books that that I can get from Chinese book markets. Japanese translation of them and I'm waiting for those books to arrive probably like in a couple months so that will be interesting you know if you've been with with my channel for a while I have introduced a lot of Japanese knitting books and how to read Japanese knitting patterns and it would be nice for me to learn how to read Japanese sewing patterns as well so that um, if if you are a sewist you might be interested in learning that as well and ah and there's one more craft <laughs> i'm going to show which is some sock darning i learned sock darning too last time in my podcast i introduced this book uh darning repair make by uh, hikaku noguchi so and uh this this is a book that teaches you how to darn everything, including t-shirts, shirts, skirts, and socks, hand-knitted or non-hand-knitted item. And, and I followed this book and learned how to darn my socks. So these socks are my first pair of hand knitted socks. These are the Sunday socks by uh, Petit Knit. Knitted top cuff down with like a French heel in a DK weight yarn. And I was a very inexperienced knitter then. And I, um, at that time I frogged a commercial hat. It was a 100% merino yarn and I thought the yarn would be nice to make socks without like understanding the delicacy of, you know, merino yarn. I knit them into a pair of socks and I've only wore the sock for a few times. Uh, well, I do wear that sort of like slippers and walking everywhere on the floor at my home. So the wearing was quite bad and uh, there were holes on the bottom and it made me a bit sad but now with starting i can repair so this is uh I think it's called English darning. There are a few different darning methods introduced in the book. And by the way, uh, it seems like there's an English 
translation version of this book, if you just search for Darning Repair Make, one of the viewers were able to find that book on Amazon or something. So feel free to give it a look if you're interested. And this is the English darning technique or something. And I used my uh, scraps of socks yarn. So for here, you sort of do the yellow uh, longitude line and then you do you weave in this green like latitude line uh, so there were a hole but now you can weave in this green line and then the hole will be closed and that's one method uh, this sock i did another method so this uh, so this sock, I used half of that 100% merino yarn and half of my grandma's yarn. So uh, my grandma's yarn was more like a woolen yarn, a little bit stronger. So this sock was not worn to holes, but like the fabric was very thin. So what I need to do was to strengthen it instead of like closing any holes. So I had some fabric to hold on to. And I could use this method to like strengthen or like thicken the material locally. And this method in the book is called you know, chained or honeycomb stitch or something. Uh, it probably doesn't matter if we're talking English here. And um, you like sew these chain you hand sew these chain chained stitches in this like swirl until you go to the middle uh, uh here i ran out of the yellow yarn so i used the green but like you can use the same colored yarn and it looks quite cute i like this method and this darning is not limited to hand knit items i also did some on my commercial socks. I like this pattern of these trees. And for this sock, I uh, the there were a hole on the toe. So I also use this like darning method to close the hole on the toe. And this uh the toe for this sock the toe doesn't have holes but the fabric was thin so i used this method they call the uh sesame salt sesame salt method where you like sew those backward stitches to uh thicken your fabric and make these like sesame or salt like dots on the right side you know, it's it's kind of cute so these are very interesting skills to learn there are still a few other uh, darning method that was introduced in the book and I can try them when I find appropriate like uh, war or torn <laughs> clothes that I want to repair so a lot of interesting crafts in this episode right so that's all my like finished crafts and i have some whips the first one is my amy slip over and it's kind of bunched up it is a slip over from this uh Sanisgar magazine in issue 2202 and I'm just making this like slip over thingy with a long belt that you can tie around below your underarm and I'm making this one using my grandma's yarn <laughs> again and I've finished the front and back piece and I'm now knitting the belt. This is like a lot of stitches on my needle and it's kind of bunched up. 
and the belt was kind of interesting. So you first you like you use the crochet chain cast on or crochet cast on something like that to create these stitches to cast on these stitches on your needle and then you pick up some stitches along this line and then you use that crochet chain cast on method again and cast on some extra stitches and later you can like you just keep knitting in the flat and these these will form the belt that you can tie like a bow tie just below your arm to uh close the front and back panel of the garment and this is the first time that i learned this method so if you know how to do a crocheted chain this method is like when you are crocheting the chain you uh, you put your knitting needle on the left and above the yarn and then you pick up the yarn with your crocheted hook from above your knitting needle you better you you probably just you can you can search for crochet chain cast on videos and i'm sure someone have described that and this method is is practically the provisional like crochet chain cast on where um, if you know it there is a provisional cast on method where you crochet your chain and then you pick up stitches with your knitting needle uh, from the pearl bumps of this crochet chain and this method is just like avoid that step of like picking up from the pearl bump later on you just like you just like put these stitches on the knitting needle already while you do the chain effectively it's the same as crochet chain and picking up but this is much easier because if you have tried that like two-step method picking up stitches from the pro bump of a crochet chain is is it's it's really tight and it's really hard to do and if you are doing a provisional cast on you can do this with your waist yarn and use your working yarn to knit the next row to do the provisional cast on and later on you can um you can un un unravel this waste yarn and uh, knit from the other direction so that's quite a handy method or like if, if you are just using your working colored yarn to do this cast on it's 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 good as well and according to the pattern book they ask you to do this crochet chain cast on because the edge of this casting on method is more stable than like your regular long tail cast on. Uh, so anyway, that's the new technique that I learned from making this. Uh, so I'm pretty much finished. I just need to finish knitting the two belt and then pick up stitches around the collar and knit the long collar and then I'll be done with it. I have another whip and you know what? This whip is a brioche, brioche project. I learned to do brioche. Last time in my podcast, I showed you like there was a knitting bingo and two things I haven't done was brioche and knitting a shawl. I had plans for knitting a shawl in the future, but now I'm going to tackle brioche. And this is the color number three by my favorite things, knitwear. Um, it is a brioche color or like dicky thing you can wear and I have some winter coat that have those like V deep V neck and I'd appreciate some like slip over or color thing that can you know make here warmer for me and this is perfect and uh, for the color this is the back piece and the front piece ha is more interesting it have some in decorative increases or decreases to form like this wedge shape but on the back it's quite it's just like 
a flat piece and brioche is so much easier than what I have imagined and it's just like there's even no purl stitches for all the purl stitches you just do a slip stitches uh, but that's like brioche in the flat and if you are doing brioche in the round I suppose you'd be doing some purl as I understand there will be some doing brioche stitches in the round of this project like for the uh, neck part you will be brioche brioching <laughs> that's I don't think that's a word you will be brioching in the round in the neck anyway and um, I look forward to learning those techniques I think it's a very nice project this color number three it's a very nice project as like an introduction to brioche because you start by doing just doing brioche in the flat which is quite easy and you get into the rhythm very fast and then you will be doing brioche in the flat but for the front panel there will be some shaping so you learn the increases and the decreases for brioche and then finally you will knit the you will knit the neck band which includes some brioching <laughs> in the round and that's like covers all those major techniques for doing brioche stitches and I look forward very much to learning those techniques uh, yarn wise I'm using my grandma's yarn I feel like there's a lot of like grandma's yarn project or if you are new here uh, when I say grandma's yarn it's that my grandma gave me a lot of her stashed yarn when she learned that I'm knitting so I got a lot of random colored weight yarn of <laughs> of different amount of them and I had to like find appropriate amount of yarn and project for each of them and sometimes there's some like yarn chicken <laughs> involved and sometimes there's some like color work involved it has been really fun and this yarn I have enough I'd probably have 200 to 300 gram of it so it should be enough for the uh, color number three so that's that and uh, new acquisitions I have a very exciting acquisition it's in this bag and this is the kit okay let me just open it it is a knitting kit coming all the way from Japan it is the wall it is the wall garden pullover designed by uh, Tokai Erika and if you've been here with my first channel I, I showed the cat sweater with that very <laughs> beautiful cat intarsia um, design that's designed by Tokai Erika so as well and she is probably my favorite Japanese designer I would say like she had a very unique color work style mostly intarsia very complicated very lively colorful detailed pattern inspired by nature and animals mostly yeah and uh, I have two of her knitting books I've only knitted one <laughs> that cat sweater of hers because her design is usually a huge commitment to do and uh, every year she released a few uh, limited edition kits for these kits you don't get the pattern you cannot just buy the pattern itself you have to buy the full kit and like this including all the yarn and the pattern and I, I think it's kind of nice because her designs 
or, or always involve a lot of colors with different amount and it is quite hard to uh, match all these colors that you needed and it can get very handy if you get a yarn and this kit the first moment i saw the release i know i must have to get it is like hitting all my uh, the soft spots that like all my favorite all my aesthetics all i i lost the english word to say it it just like hit right at my heart and i'll put some picture of the finished sweater the pattern is like a like European style uh, stone wall and there were flowers and little windows and little flowers of different colors on it and I don't know why but ever since I was small I had this like dream cozy location that just resembles that and like even from a, <laughs> even when I was like four or four or five and when like grown when adults ask me to draw my favorite place or my dream favorite place i would like draw these little houses with flowers and windows i don't i don't know why but that 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 sort of scene just like warms my heart and and uh, and i even have a a wedding photo i'll put it here that looks very similar to this sweater pattern where uh on, on my wedding day i was uh, we, we were just like walking passing by this sort of wall garden and i i just really like that scenery and i took a photo and anyway when i saw this sweater design i just have to i i know i just have to knit it and uh i got it with a lot of fancy yarns and fancy colors. I think mostly this yarn was British Eloica from Puppy Yarn. Um, if you're interested, you can still order this kit from Japan. Um, in their Puppy Yarn, in the this Puppy Yarn official website, there are a few other kits by Tokai, Tokai Erikasa available but this one is my favorite and I have to get it. You can pay by PayPal and uh, they ship worldwide through EMS and they have an English version of the website that you can order from, which is really good. And uh, from the ordering to arriving of the package, it only took like one week. It arrived uh, it arrived one day before my defense, two days before my birthday. I ordered this as my birthday gift, so <laughs> it's like perfect timing. And uh, it also it also includes this uh, the chart and schematics pattern here printed in a large piece in a large piece of paper, but it's in Japanese. So, uh, but I think you will still you 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 can still use it if you like, and you can also get my help for reading these patterns. Oh, and by the way, um, on my coffee commission, I'm putting out some extra services that you can use, and one of them is like pattern translation for. Uh, Japanese patterns like if you own some personal Japanese patterns and want to learn how to read or how to use them I can annotate a PDF scan of your pattern for you with like all the English by the side of your uh, of the Japanese notes and if you are a knitwear designer and want to have your pattern be translated to Chinese I can also offer that as well uh, but I won't be able to translate like English pattern for Japanese because my Japanese is not that level yet. It's only for Japanese to English. And if you are in Vancouver, I'm offering private lessons uh, at my home or some public meeting places in Vancouver. I'm not teaching in 
uh, the yarn shop anymore because they have reorganized the shop and there's no space for teaching basically but you can schedule lessons with me uh, for like any items you want to knit or any specific techniques that you want to learn and if you're interested you can go ahead to my Kofi Kofi site I'll put all the links below so back to acquisition and plan this kit will be my next cast on i'm i'm also having another cast on idea uh, from this book i have showed this before many times that i want to knit this uh gunsi ganser as they call that it is very similar to the ingrid sweater by petit knit but i love this shape better and i have even made my swatch I, and also, I don't own any like cable styled sweater, and I really like that. But this one is competing with the wall garden sweater, so I don't know which one I should do first, or should I just cast on both sweaters together? I think I can do that. Will I be able to finish two sweaters by the end of this year? I don't know. I'm almost done with my PhD. I have a lot of free time. I could do that. I could knit both sweaters at the same time and then hopefully by by the end of this year I will have two awesome sweaters to to show off. So I think that's everything I have for this episode. That's already a lot. If you enjoyed my content, please like, comment, subscribe. If you haven't, I really appreciate you spending time with me. And that keeps me going further in my knitting and crafting journey. Uh, if you find any of the tips or tricks I talked about were helpful to you, please consider donate on my Ko-fi ko-fi.com slash seedling stitch you can buy me a coffee for once or become a monthly subscriber i am making these videos quite regularly and i'm also thinking maybe like i can offer online classes or tutorials depending on how much time i have and what device i can get I am on Ravelry as Athena Liu. You can find all my patterns here as well as on my coffee shop. I am on Instagram as SD underline Athena where I post what I make a bit more frequently. And one more thing, I'm thinking of making some Chinese language podcasts as well. Um, I have some audience in the like the Chinese video platform called Bilibili where I have been syncing all these English language videos but these might not be accessible for all my Chinese audience and just as a Chinese person I think it would be nice to talk about my project for a Chinese audience as well I will be making these Chinese language videos and posting them on this Bilibili platform but I'm wondering if it would bother you if I post them here on YouTube as well or if you would like to have them on YouTube. I will not have time to make subtitles and the projects that I cover would be similar to what I do with the English language podcast but my imaginary audience will be like Chinese knitters knitting in China and I might try to introduce how to use English patterns for example to them so the focus might be a little bit different uh, let, let me know what you think about Chinese language podcast uh, whether to put them on YouTube or not that brings us to the end normally I would play some piece of piano but I think this episode is already getting too long and I'm too tired to practice playing piano this time so let's just end here thank you for sticking with me for so long and uh, have a good time take care of yourself happy knitting goodbye